So, so let's let, let's dive in here into this conversation about conversations that's going to focus on the user research and how it mattered in the development of this tool. I've now turned on the recording. So let me introduce the players. So we've got uh, my three co-panelists from Duke University. Uh, I'm from Longsight. Longsight is a commercial affiliate in the Sakai community. We host Sakai for 80 colleges and universities and other organizations. And let me introduce my co-panelists. So first is Bendy Fagg. She is the lead information architect and UX designer for Duke Creative and UX team within Duke's Office of Information Technology. The creative and, and UX team is is uh, is called Crux by its friends, and uh, we've had a lot of great opportunities to work with them through this project. So Bendy led our user research efforts for this project with focus groups, usability testing, and prioritize, prioritizing of results. Next to her is Jen Hubbard. Jen is a user interface designer for Duke's creative and user interface team, the Crux team. So Jen is the one who designed the user experience for conversations. And so we're gonna be turning to her a little bit later in the panel to talk to her about how she crafted this design based upon the user research findings that emerged from this project. And last but not least is Michael Green. Many of you know Michael. He's the Associate Director at Duke Learning Innovation. He's been overseeing learning technology strategy and services for Duke. And he led all of the project management efforts on the conversations team. And he was he was deeply involved in envisioning the product as well and bringing in lots and lots of faculty input and student input from, from Duke University. One of the highlights of this project was the opportunity for Duke teachers and Duke students to directly influence how this project emerged. So let's let's kick off with a framing question from Michael. So here's my question to you. What prompted Duke to begin the Conversations Project? All right. Yeah, good day, folks. Um, thank you for your time and attention today. Um, yeah, so as Duke entered the 2020 fall semester, you know, we were approached by one of our vendors that needed uh, to change their business model as part of you know a response to the pandemic and we sat down with them and you know we realized that we weren't going to be able to negotiate successfully and so we took a step back and considered what we could do to provide this q a functionality to the duke community in ways that best align with our values and uh, so we favor interoperability so we did pilot an external third-party tool but we decided not to uh, stop there. We also favor openness and transparency. And we knew, uh, you know, through conversations with our peers that we were trying to solve a, a problem that was shared by them. And we saw an opportunity to build something that we could share back with the higher ed community at large. We also, um, you know, we ground our work in evidence-based practices and research. And we saw an opportunity to both review the literature around online discussion spaces and also, uh, you know, through this partnership with the Crux team, you know, do our own user research and uncover the needs of the Duke community. So thinking about this even further, what's different and noteworthy about the way that you constructed the team that was going to take on this project? Yeah. So. Um, Another one of our values at Learning Innovation is to, whenever possible, bring a diverse collaborative group of folks together to solve problems. And so I represent one of four teams in our department. And, you know, the, the learning technology services team that I lead, we, we often, you know, work collaboratively with other teams in DLI. We often work with Longsight or we often work with Crux, um, but we hadn't had all four of the learning innovation teams partner with all of the other four learning innovation teams and with Longsight and with Crux. We, we hadn't put together a team quite like that before. And so that was a really interesting piece of this project. The, the composition of the team uh, had folks with backgrounds in user experience uh, research, yeah, user interface design, instructional technology, um, academic research, web development, pedagogy, um, as well as a five member faculty cohort that we met with uh, weekly throughout the project. And we knew that we 
wanted to solve this problem, you know, we wanted to do things the right way, we needed to do them fast. And, you know, so we came to the conclusion that we needed, you know, this larger project team with this wider variety of backgrounds and different expertise to make that happen. The group established early on that it was going to be critical to gather a wide variety of data upfront in order to, to fuel our decision making. So we collected user stories both at Duke and, and some of you may have participated in some Sakai community exercises we did that where we collected user stories. Um, we you know collected a wide variety of uh, usability testing feedback and really built this this partnership and process between the research and the design and development process. Um, I think the last thing I'll note is that um, we kicked the project off in March of 2021, and we wanted to offer a beta to the Duke community in August, um, which was very ambitious. And we wanted to do that with a newly remote project team, as we all were at that time, and in the middle of a pandemic. And um, I'm really proud to say that we we did that. We accomplished those goals. All right, let's let's dive into what we've learned along the way. So, uh, Bendy, let's let's start with you. So I'm kind of curious, you know, what kinds of user research did the team do? Yeah, and as Michael mentioned, um, the learning innovation team alongside, they had already started working on some things before the Crux team joined everyone. And so they were running sessions at Duke and with the Sakai community and various end users to in order to generate 300 user stories. They were also doing a literature review of 70 peer reviewed articles and that and that generated about 42 recommendations. Um, then they were later reviewing user stories and they pulled out 10 values that are innate to our users desires. And so when Jen and I joined on, we um, we ran some separate focus groups for undergraduate and graduate students. Um, we did a product analysis of Piazza and discussions, uh, Campus Wire, Slack, and Microsoft Teams. And we were just looking at these other products to help frame our design direction. Um, and once uh, we started, Jen was uh, building mockups for us. Uh, we conducted usability tests on different inter iterations of the user interface. Um, and we were doing th these usability testing. We were doing these with students and instructors, and that generated an additional like 130 plus pieces of feedback that we've categorized and prioritized. So that's a, that's a lot of data gathering. What were the insights from this research uh, that affected the design of conversations? I'm curious if you can pull out a couple of the big ones to share with us. Yeah, so I really, I wanna share like three main areas that really stood out to us after doing this. Um, and as Michael mentioned too, we were on a very um, tight timeline. And so it was great that we could all work in these teams and we were working concurrently. Um, and what came out of that is the number one thing was having one screen navigation. So we heard in the user, user focus groups, particularly that they, that students really wanted um, wanted the tool to make posts easier to navigate and that they could read it in one screen. They wanted to re reduce the number of interactions that they had to do to read something or comment on a post. Um, and then we looked at back at the other research we did you know, from the focus groups and in our literature review, we found that there was one main thing that came out of that with encouraging simplicity in the structure of online discussions in the user stories. Um, people wrote that they want to be able to see posts and responses on one screen. They didn't want to have to click down several levels or go through several screens to get to comments or post a comment, and they really wanted a cleaner design. And then again, in the focus groups, uh, students mentioned a lot about really liking Piazza, um, the way they could navigate the user interface in one screen, just having few clicks. And they noted just making the post more visually appealing and less overwhelming and easier to read. So, and they mentioned some ideas of using more white space, using more color, maybe putting boxes around posts to help um, them make them easier to read. Then um, the second thing I want to mention is our emojis and upvoting. And so in our literature review, um, we came across something called conversational cues quite a bit in the literature review, which is it provides a quick way to respond and acknowledge you are listening and being heard um, by using emojis 
or something like upvoting, you can respond without writing text. And so that was um, what we also heard a lot in the focus groups with students. Um, students mentioned wanting emojis. And again, they just said they liked the idea of being able to respond without having to write a comment or write something out. Just a quick and easier way to let somebody know that they're listening and they're being heard. Um, this It also came up in our user stories that we had one about being able to use emojis. Um, and so we did put these in to, in our initial um, UI designs. We had a limited set of emojis and we also had upvoting, but we did some usability testing on these and instructors seemed to have mixed feelings about these two things. Some did not want upvoting or emojis at all. And, and Jen's gonna tell us in a minute um, what we did uh, after we had heard that feedback. Um, and so, and then a lot with the limited set of emojis, the students instructors often they did not know what the emojis meant. Um, and many of them said they wouldn't use them. And, you know, most students also weren't quite sure what upfooting was and how it was being used. And then the third thing I want to talk about is anonymity. Um, and in our literature review, privacy was a big um, component that came out of that literature review. And in our user stories, um, being able to post anonymously so classmates don't know who is asking the question, that was a big user story for us. And in focus groups, students, again, just really talked about a lot about the importance of anonymity in posting it, especially with questions. They just talked about they didn't want to feel like something they were asking was dumb, or they just didn't want people to know sometimes um, that maybe they didn't know something. And that was really important to them. All right. Jen, let's let's turn to you. I mean, so as we think about these three key insights from user research, one screen navigation, emojis and upvoting and anonymity, how did the design reflect what we learned in these three areas? Yeah, yeah. Happy to talk about that. So the biggest thing um, was, you know, going into this is it we weren't exactly designing something that existed. So that's always good and bad. Um, but having those focus groups and knowing that people, for instance, really liked um, the layout of Piazza in terms of having all your posts and whatever you're currently reading, whichever post you've selected in one screen. So that was kind of a driving force for the initial, like, what is this thing going to look like? Um, so we... Um, so I, you know, went with a two column layout, you've got your post list next to whatever you're currently reading. So you don't have to, there's not as much clicking around, you don't have to click back to go back to your post list. Um, yeah, users don't have as many clicks to get to what they need to. Um, one thing that like, in looking at, you know, other platforms and things and like looking at Piazza, I was like, well, Piazza does have that layout that people are looking for, but it's, got a lot going on. Um, it's kind of confusing. Um, so then the next thing was like, okay, I really wanted to focus on that simplicity, um, having something that's clean, easy to read. Um, and I really think that we did this. There's there's lots of white space. Um, there's a clear and um, hierarchy with the typography. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the ways that I took that initial um, initial information we found out in terms of what users were, would be looking for and um, came up with the UI design. And then from there, um, you know, like Bendy said, we had upvoting and we had emoji reactions in um, our first like beta iteration. And after the testing, you know, when we realized that upvoting was perhaps confusing to students and maybe some faculty didn't want to use it at all with their um, with their their Sakai site. Um, we decided to make that optional. Um, so now it's in the tool settings. It's a feature that can be turned or turned off. Um, so, you know, no one's forced to use it. Um, and then with emojis, um, you know, we had a limited set. And like Bendy said, we got feedback that, you know, the perhaps the ones we had in there sometimes were confusing. Um, users weren't sure what they stood for. And um, and so for me, I took a step back and looked at, you know, what are other applications doing? And certainly there are still applications out there that are using limited sets like Facebook, you know, and LinkedIn, they have a limited set. Um, 
But largely, you know, the trend is that most applications and communications tools are letting their users use the full emoji set. Um, you know, users are used to having that on their phone with messaging apps. Even I've, you know, some communications tools and meeting tools like Zoom, I've noticed um, they had a limited set and now you can you can use any of the emo um, emojis that you want. And it just will allow for a wider range of expressions and quick responses for users. So we're we're working to get the full set in there now. Um, and then and then lastly, like a non an an anonym <laughs> I have a hard time saying that. Um, posting anonymously um, was very important and um, is was actually like a really easy UI um, a UI implementation. Um, so I made it really easy to enable anonymous posts and by adding a checkbox in the post option. So when someone creates a post or edits a post, um, it's very clear um, and easy to find. There's a checkbox that um, will allow un will allow anonymous posting. Um, so it's always nice when um, something that is so important is is also an easy thing to implement. Nice, thank you. Um, let's let's turn back to Michael for um, a couple of of closing thoughts, and then we can turn to. The, the folks in the room for some questions. You guys can start thinking about your uh, your difficult questions and you can start flinging them into the chat while we uh, talk to Michael about a few key takeaways from this project. So, so Michael, we've been at this for well over a year now. And how would you describe the value of conversations for Duke at this point based upon what you've seen and what you've learned? Sure, so um, the first thing I've got to say is how uh, how proud I am of the project team and all, all of the DLI leadership. I mean, we, you know, we we thought we understood what we were asking them to do. I don't think we understood how daunting and how massive of an undertaking it was, um, but but the team came through. And so the value I see most um, clearly and most regularly is is in the professional de development or the growth of those team members. Um, most of them had never been part of a product development project or a UX driven project. And we continually ask them to do things they hadn't done before. Um, and each week someone you know, new would step up and help us get over the next hurdle. Outside of the team, we, uh, we see an improvement across the Duke community, right? So we, we view the role of the learning management system as providing a solid foundation for students and faculty to used to support their learning and conversations offers an expansion of that foundation. This semester's beta was used in, um, in more than 60 courses. Uh, it had over 1200 posts and 3000 replies. And we're, we're really pleased with that growth. That's really nice to see. So as, as we look at this pattern of growth, what's next for conversations? Yeah, so the, the tool itself continues to improve. We knew early on um, that we wanted to get to a point where we could support more discussion types, more than just the, the Q&A. That was our immediate need. And so one of the things we did this past spring was we were able to add threaded discussion um, to, to the beta. And now we have a model in the tool that can support you know other discussion types as well. And we also said on day zero that we were going to build conversations in a way that we could uh, share it back with the greater Sakai community. And so now it is part of the Sakai 22 release and it's available for broader development and adoption. And, and so I, I get the cop out answer of uh, what's next is up to the Sakai community. No, not that answer. <laughs> All right. Thanks to, uh, to to the three of you. It is 12, 11 p.m. Eastern. So we have about nine minutes remaining in this session for questions. So let me uh, let me ask the folks in the room if you have any questions for the panel. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll definitely get them answered. So this is our own very little stump the chump moment. So I invite you to participate. So. While you guys think about your questions, uh, I will fling another one or two at the panel. <clears throat> so one of the things that we have talked about a lot internally in the team is notifications. 
um, you know, trying to trying to build notifications into learning conversations so that they enhance the conversation and enhance people's engagement in the conversation. So I'm kind of curious if the three of you could could speak to the kinds of user research we've done around notifications, the kinds of things we've learned and the directions that that leads us in. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I wanted to share, I'm looking at my, some notes I have here that, um, yeah, we did, we heard, the thing that we heard the most, I think, in the focus groups with the undergrad, graduate and graduate students was around notifications, that it's super important. They have so much going on in their life, classes, social life, everything that they're doing. Um, they really need the notifications to be like spot on. Um, so that was just overwhelmingly a big thing we heard. And it was also in the user stories um, that we had people wanting to receive emails when someone has answered a question or resp responded to their post. And then we recently did an evaluation survey for uh, what Michael mentioned, the 60 courses that we're using, conversations. And we also heard from users that they want more granular control over types of notifications. Right. And so, so Jen, what are, what are, what are your thoughts about uh, how best to iterate the design to make notifications possible? because of the, the way in which we've heard about how important they are for, for students and for teachers. Yeah, um, I think, you know, working with the team um, and understanding what the requirements exactly would be. And then it sounds to me like, you know, that's something that would be a big part of the tool settings. Um, and, you know, if it may, perhaps it may mean um, tool settings you know, may need to kind of rethink maybe where those are accessed. Um, I'm not sure now if if students need to change any settings, so it may not be visible for students. I can't quite remember. Um, so yeah, it just may be thinking about the best way to um, to make it really clear and obvious where to go to um, to you know change or edit your your settings to receive notifications. So, Michael, turning to you and notifications, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts that, that you want to share about notifications from a, a, a project management perspective or from a user story perspective. Um, I think notifications is one of a couple areas that that really stick out to me in terms of something I learned in the project, right? The, the difference between um, you know consumer experiences. Um, more open social experiences and classroom social experiences. It was really interesting to uncover um, how, how, the, how our users felt and reacted differently in those different spaces. Notifications was one of them, the reactions and upvoting was another one. You know, these are things we saw everywhere and you know, folks would tell us they, they want them. And then there were always these subtle differences that, that we had to, to get right and if you didn't it just felt off and that was a um, you know it was a great learning experience for for me and um, you know I think I, I'd like to soapbox for a minute and say I, I don't think it's very common that universities have a group like the crux group um, and you know if you have the opportunity to evolve the strategy at your institution I would I would definitely investigate something like that it's been it's been remarkable both I mean, this was a product development project, which we knew needed design and, and UX, but um, we we find a, a partnership with a group like them in in any of our service, you know, uh, operation work or or improvement work. It's it's just fascinating what that kind of thinking and folks with that expertise can help you uncover and, and improve for your institution. So. I'm still not seeing any questions in the public chat, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> I'm gonna have to soldier on here with uh, with a few of our other back pocket questions. So, if anyone uh, in the room has questions, now is the time to put them in the chat so we so you can get them answered. Uh, but I will let me ask my panelists one additional question. So, so Michael alluded a little bit earlier on to how 
this was basically the process of launching a startup in a pandemic with an all remote team uh, that hadn't previously been remote. And I, I wonder if we can dig a little bit deeper into some of the challenges about the way the project was set up. In some of our earlier conversations, uh, the panelists shared that this was an unusual design project. Uh, so Bendy and Jenna, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to what made this project uh, unlike the kinds of design projects that you had done prior to the pandemic that you may look to do in the future. What, what was different about all of this? Yeah, I think we typically are working just with our small group and things kind of maybe I'm just going to use this term waterfall method where maybe you're doing the literature review first and then user stories and then you're doing some interviews or focus groups. And so I think this was different in that we had a bigger team to work with and things were happening in parallel um, that user stories and literature re review was happening at the same time that we were planning and doing the focus groups with students. Um, so I think it was just a lot of us learning how are we all going to work together very quickly because we, on our, we were on a very short timeline and um, sometimes that can get messy, but that's okay. And realizing like, oh, it, that it's okay that it's getting messy and that we can adjust as we go. Um, and yeah, and we had to just learn how to do things differently. Um, we typically don't do focus groups because of groupthink, um, trying to mitigate that, but we needed information very quickly and focus groups are a great way to do that. And so we planned activities to help mitigate groupthink. We used Google Jamboard and breakout rooms and Zoom and um, asking more individualized questions within the bigger uh, focus groups to help mitigate that um, were just some of the things that we did. All right, thanks. Um, so there has been one question posed in the chat, so I definitely wanna make sure with one minute remaining that we address that. So thank you to uh, our friends at the, at the Lake House Watch Party. They ask, what's been the reaction of fans of Piazza faculty members to the new tool? I will take that one. Um, and I, I think the, the short answer is probably what you'd expect, it's mixed. Um, so if if I had to poorly stereotype fans of Piazza faculty members, I would say generally they are not fans of the LMS, um, and they they generally look to more um, custom or, or or more specific external tools to meet their learning goals. And so some of them uh, did that instantly. They they were who brought us. Um, you know, Ed discussions for a pilot, and they said, well, we heard about Piazza, and this is another thing we heard about, and so can we take a look at that? And so some of them did that. Um, we had some some of them try the conversations tool and um, give us tremendous feedback, um, but there were, there's still some features that they were looking for um, that, that, aren't, that aren't there yet. You know, we haven't nailed the notifications and that was a big one because these are some of, at Duke, these are some of our largest classes. And so us not, not getting the notifications just right became a little um, unmanageable. And so that's, that's why we're continuing to invest there. All right. It is 12.20 p.m. Eastern, so we are at our wrap-up time for this session. So I want to say thanks to our, our panelists from Duke, uh, Bendy and Jen and Michael. Thank you all for uh, for providing some insights today. And I'm, I'm personally really psyched that we were able to tell the user research story and the, the, and the, the user experience design story that maybe we haven't had a chance to focus on yet. So thanks to all of you for taking some time. And thanks to the now 17 of us who are hanging out in the room with us. So um, by all, um, I'm going to wrap up the session here, uh, take a few minutes of break, and uh, please do come back at 1230 for our next set of breakout rounds. So bye-bye all. Thank you.